Make. Yo. You better be saying hi to Tara Tara Hot, Indiana. Tara Hot, Indiana. Hello. Is that was that your hello? No, but why uh, not? Indiana State. Yeah, cream. We should be saying hi to Seton Hall. We should be saying hi to uh, to St. John's. We should be saying hi to everybody who we robbed of an opportunity to to play in the play in game. We were 69th in Ken Palm. All I ever hear you do Ken is Palm. talk about Ken Palm. You're Ken like, Palm. When I ask you what's the system for betting games, you're like, it's Ken Palm. It's I'm not Ken Palm. Ken Palm. I love it. I, it's Bart Torvik, which is essentially Ken Palm. <laughs> See? So here's the thing I get why people hate us. And when people were comparing us to Iowa football the other night, of course, we're talking about Virginia basketball, who had 14 points in the first half, at which point me and Kyle turned on John Madden and played Madden in the second half. Kyle beat me. Oh, Iowa, game, but that's Iowa football. It. So two programs that just win all the time. That's, okay. That's and what, the Kansas City that's, Chiefs. But seriously, is that I, the comparison we're supposed to be mad about? I think enjoy the Iowa joke. They're like, oh, it's fun to watch football where there's like not a lot of scoring. But it's not fun to watch college basketball where there's not a lot of scoring. I have so much respect for Tony Bennett. I'm not – towing this Stephen A. Smith line at all. But what I am saying is I understand why people hate us. Virginia is replay review in the NFL. You say you hate it, but deep down you love it because it, it leads to conversation. It leads to people being big mad. Yeah, when, when have we ever gotten Stephen A. Smith to talk about a playing game? Right. Exactly. Yeah, I, it was surreal. All the things that UVA basketball has done, and we're looking at you know UVA basketball graphic up on uh, what was it? Uh, it led every show. It's just things. UVA in general. I remember going back to when I was in junior high, and we went to Lane Stadium to watch you guys play the Hokies, and throughout the parking lot, you could hear Colin Cowherd's monologue, mm -hmm. uh, which was the anti-UVA. You guys are a bunch of yuppies monologue, and at the time, it really pissed me off, but. You become desensitized to it. And as you guys were saying while we were watching, this is the ultimate Virginia fan experience. We lack the firepower. We're just not up for the big one. And the big one always gets us. We're just not, re we're just not ready. The big one always gets us. Too many okay. practices, not enough practices. They had three practices since Sunday. Somebody said that was not enough. Too many. Look, nobody wanted to watch it. Coach Bennett didn't want to watch it. He said the group was maxed out. Uh huh. There was one returning starter. They won 23 games. I... Um, I think if Kyle was out there, we could have scored 16 points in the first half. <laughs> I think if they were had a harder time finishing on some of those second chance. Completely agree. I think yeah. if there were six guys out there for Virginia instead of five, it wouldn't have made a difference. <laughs> we we're just that bad. Yeah. So we shouldn't have been in there. Five. So you you admit we shouldn't have been in there. Well, I think we earned the bid. <laughs> I mean, this is a pretty simple argument to follow, fellas. No, it's really not. We earned the bid. We earned the bid, and then we played very but poorly. But yet we weren't good enough to be out there. Plenty of teams are going to lose today and tomorrow. Not not like that. Oh, sure. Not like that. Frickin' Boise. Oh, it was disgusting. You know, the reason people hate UVA is your attitude. All right. Hate us because you ain't us. We win almost 80% of the I can basketball admit it. Games. We shouldn't have probably been in that tournament, and I'm sorry. And so what I did is I got online, I followed the prompts, and I donated to St. John's University Athletic Department and Seton Hall's athletic department. I'm not donating to Indiana State. I'd like to give uh, another shout out. Well, though. can I finish this? Yes. 42, po 42 points the other night. I went $42 Okay. for 12 months. That that really adds up. So this is my olive branch to the people of uh, St. John, wherever the fuck that is, New York. Yep. Yes. And uh, Seton Hall, wherever the fuck that is. New so Jersey. New Jersey. Uh, I'm sorry. You guys probably shouldn't have been in the. You probably should have been in the tournament. Yeah, St. John's wasn't even the first four out. Should have been in the tournament. Hey, how'd that work out for you? You're always like, I can't watch Virginia. Oh, I can't watch Virginia games with anyone else because it's bad luck. No, not because it's bad luck. Because you guys are casuals and don't understand the game and piss me off. Wow. I oh, literally casuals. do an NFL podcast with you. Huh? <laughs> huh? I literally pay you to do an NFL podcast with me. You're the definition of an NFL casual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can't watch the game with us for one night? No, I'm Joe Fan. The audience relates to Joe Fan. Mm -hmm. You know? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You need, you, you need Joe Fan alongside. I think there's alongside. good points on both sides of the fence here. Well, he wouldn't come watch the game with us the other night because he's got this lifelong bit where he doesn't watch any UVA sports it's with us. You know what? I went and watched the game. Bit. You don't, you don't do it. You don't watch the game. Night. You don't watch football games either. Like pizza. With other people. It's a, it's a, I'm, I'm not defending it. It's a weird thing, but it's how I like to watch my Maybe Virginia we should sports. break the trend and watch Virginia sports. No. You know who did watch no, I the don't, game? Some, the fine some, folks. Scri some scripts need to be flipped The there, fine man. folks exactly. at Camp Collins. Oh, yeah, I hate all the national The fine folks at Camp Collins just, in Fort no. Collins, Colorado, who enjoyed their Colorado State Rams 
dominating a, a, a perennial powerhouse. Let's call it what it is: the Virginia Cavaliers. Blue blood. A blue blood team. Now we're talking. We should be appreciative of the fact that we are so bent out of shape by the way this team looked. Because when I left Charlottesville in 2009, UVA was kind of the laughing stock, and I remember the football team was the reason that they were competitive. They were the 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 buddy lead. We were the city on the hill. Of they were the buddy lead genes of the the program. And I left, and the next thing you know, UVA is at Rosenblatt every season. They're in the College World Series. They won it one year, I think, a couple of years. Brian 15, O'Connor. You should have left up. sooner. Great 2015. coach. The basketball team. I, Get I, out you know, now. I'm sitting in a Matt Nagy meeting, uh, the coach of the year that year, by the way, and he's showing Kyle Guy and his perseverance and the national championship, the blue blood pedigree that it takes to win. So – that's the silver it takes lining. Takes NBA here. players to win. There were multiple NBA That's players the silver on that lining. Yeah. So UVA so unless we is not, can get no, it. UVA this, is not this, a bottom of the barrel. This deal. is a pure. You know what Kyle Guy had? Toughness. Correct. A little swag too. The, the correct. He's a big toughness guy. The problem. Huge. I've been saying it for a while here. The problem with the system here at Virginia is that you really need players to be here three, four, five years, and that's not going to happen anymore in this portal era. So, it it. Maybe. maybe we do need to. I'm not saying Tony. Tony is the man, but maybe we need to do some a little Junior different. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Do maybe things. make layups. I know Tony can't make layups or contest his shots near the the rim. Like you those know, guys just looked so tight the other night. So and not tight, happy bro. to be out there holding the ball like this. You just got in the tournament. Nobody thinks you're supposed to be there. You're supposed to play with house money, but instead the ghost of UMBC follows us everywhere we go, and it follows our psyche as Virginia fans. And this is the thing. Kyle brought up a good point. I can remember being a kid and when we got in the tournament. It was like, oh, we're in the tournament. Yeah. Yeah. Probably not going to win fun. a single game. NIT. No, we're in the NIT. Okay. Which is now fraught with with uh, shout out to Pete Gillen, CBS with game throwing. I'm pretty Coach sure because if you're in the NIT, like yeah. you should probably just yeah. throw the game. I'm not saying that for real, but like in the in the minds of some of these young kids who aren't getting paid, and they might fifth year seniors up at Madison Square Garden. Like, hey, fuck it, dude, we're playing Seton Hall. They're supposed to win the NIT. They're supposed to be in the NCAA tournament because Virginia sucks. Oh. Okay, uh, so I'll just say this: I acknowledge the fact that we are bent out of shape when this stuff happens, and that's a good thing because that that means we've been somewhere. And I thought the, the I thought that winning a title for a couple years would it would be like playing with house money for the rest of your life as a fan. But what it does is it robs you of your joy and you're acutely aware of what like being on heroin is. That's why the you know Patriots like nothing so else nothing else works. That's why the pa- Patriots fans are so miserable. Yeah. Can I can I lie? Well, they're just miserable they're in general. They're chasing the dragon. They don't the get enough sunlight. Is, they don't get enough vitamin D the up in New England. The dragon is the synergy between a coach and a great and a great roster. You need and, the sun. And sometimes like sun. UVA, they have the great coach and people want him fired, but people also want him retained for life, right? Okay. Nobody with a with a with a brain but there is that argument so I just I just want to I want to interject not everybody cares about Virginia as much but I feel like if we didn't say anything about Virginia people would have said oh you guys are hiding from this thing I'm not hiding from this thing this is who we are this is exactly who we are there's as, are as an athletic program there's one valid excuse it's an excuse but I think it's valid okay who's were rolling in 2020 23 and 7 they had won about 10 in a row and COVID comes along and yeah, every program had to deal with the, the COVID pause, but only one team coming off a championship had to deal with it. So you really had that momentum stopped in its tracks. Okay, that's fair. Poor I would argue that here. that helps the team coming off a national That's fair. Can, can we get that breath? Let's talk about Shohei Otani. Do you remember in Godzilla Minus One when the, the kamikaze came home and he didn't run his plane into Pearl Harbor and they were like, why are you here? Like, I feel like it's going to be even worse when this guy comes home unemployed. Like, people are like, you let Shohei down. Damn. Because people are going to have to believe the lie that the MLB is going to tell. I mean, they're, they're going to sweep this under the rug. He's so going to be the fall guy. Oh, they're <laughs> going to kill Oh, the translator's doing the honorable thing. He's doing the honorable thing. He's thrusting his samurai sword into his chest <laughs> cavity. can they yes. see through that for a time? I knew you were going to bring up Godzilla. I don't know Godzilla. if they can. Are they going to say, you must die? They don't have a – there's – the problem – okay, this is an interesting thing because – as we talk about this, his legacy in America, even if they sweep this under the rug, I think a lot of people are going to be convinced, including myself, that Shohei Otani is a gambler. And I don't think he's a degenerate gambler. Because when you really put into context what he was gambling, he's got like 680 mil coming down the pipe in the future here. Like, I don't think he's gambling irresponsibly for The way he has it dollars. structured would seem as if he, he might have some habits that he's protecting himself from. 
No question. Which is cool. No question. And like gambling on its head, if he's not gambling on baseball, is not the end of the world. I think he can overcome this. Part of being an ultra over competitive person. Like it's in every locker room. No People gamble. They love to gamble. They want in on the action, right? All the time. But the rules are getting a little bit more, you know, like especially if you've moved to America and you don't understand, like the translator alleges that he didn't know that this bookie who he bought it or he met at a poker tournament, he didn't know that 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 you know, betting offshore or betting with an illegal book is in fact illegal. The translator got something lost in translation. Yep. This guy makes 300 to 500 K a year. He's been working since 2008. His name's IP Mizuhara. Okay. Hey, uh, yeah. and you're, you're, uh, you're American. When you go into the bathroom, you're American. When you come out of the bathroom, what are you when you're in the bathroom? European. European. Okay. The only thing that's not being discussed is so so to get so, so, proud of so to give like people it. a little background here. The translator who's been working since 2018, Thank making a boatload of money, is alleged to have engaged in massive theft of Otani. Only after Otani's uh, spokesperson, who's basically a backup translator, because he lost his other translator. Like this guy's like he, he tapped the right arm, and the backup translator comes in, and the backup translator puts the old translator in contact with ESPN. They do a 90 minute interview. This is like Tuesday and then Wednesday. They say, no, we retract his entire statement that we sent him to give because our lawyers called us and said, no, it's not going to work if you say that Otani was, was a part of the transaction where he allegedly was covering up for this guy's losses, like where he's helping his buddy out. And I, I do. So is that what the buddy said on the interview? He essentially was like, Shohei has a problem and I'm covering him? No. What his buddy said on the interview was that I have a problem and Shohei was covering for me. Got it. They found these wires evidently in January. They kicked this guy's door down, this guy, uh, Matthew Boyer. Okay. But evidently, it, it was back in October that they kicked this guy's door down. And then in January, they uncovered the wires from Otani. Four and a half million in total, but two particular wires in the fall. And I don't understand this part exactly. So, Matt, help me out if, I, if I'm butchering it. But, you know, like those two wires in question, it is alleged by the translator that Otani was standing there and helped him put those wires through. And then they reversed course on Wednesday and computer. said, no, nah, that's not what happened at all. This is theft. He stole from Otani. And here's my issue. You, you mean to tell me in, in, the, in, the, in the reality where the translator is stealing four and a half million dollars from his good friend, that he's willing to steal from his good friend, but he is not betting baseball for fear that his employer will find out and fire him. If you get found out, you're not going to have a job because your best friend is going to fire you. It's almost as if he was already found out. He well, already knew. No, it's almost as if the guy placing bets has something to lose yeah. betting baseball. Yeah. And I don't think that guy has enough to lose, relatively speaking, if we are to believe that he's stealing from his best friend to the tune of $4.5 million. That, to me, is the biggest red flag when it comes to Otani being the one placing these bets. Because if you're not betting baseball, you have to be afraid to bet baseball. And I don't think this guy seems like a guy who's very afraid. Can we put it into context, like... So was it four and a half million? Four and a half million. So four and a half million for relative to what Shohei's worth is say like you make a hundred thousand in a year. What, what six grand for one year? Shohei's making seventy million this yeah. year. So if I mean, you it's make a hundred. It's not. It's grand. not much money for Otani. Okay, so I'll just tell you. I'll tell you this. Like the other part that I would poke a hole in the in the theft hypothesis is like um, you know this guy's with Shohei every hour of the day. You're going to tell me he's he's sweating international soccer, he's probably betting Turkish basketball like the Jags guy who stole mm -hmm. from the Jags. Dude, Shohei's a degenerate. No, uh, what I'm saying is like if you're to believe that the translator yes. is that he, they're together every hour of the day. You don't think that Shohei would be like maybe my friend has a gambling problem or maybe they're just watching together. Or maybe they're that's gambling together. Saying. Yeah, and, and he is the fall guy because ultimately that's what I think is happening. He's 100% the fall guy. Also, and, and also this, Kev, and like, you know, I don't think a bookie, you tell me, is going gonna, is gonna to let a, a regular guy rack up $4.5 million in debt. And I also don't think a bookie is going to brag about having Shohei Otani on the books unless it's Shohei Otani. I could be wrong. So this book's got ties to the, to, to minor league players that that's documented. Yeah, they got they got popped. Yeah. Yeah. And he and he got popped in November. They saw all this. They had a few months to figure out, hey, how are we gonna fix this? He signs the big deal with the Dodgers. Ooh. The wires 
were all the issue because the guy, the book didn't think he had eyes on him, and he did. And when that comes out, now we got to fix this. And of course, what you just said is correct in the fact that you're not going to take a play that big from a random guy. No, you're not. No chance. Not, you're not. And not also, no, you're not, not going to let you're not going to let a tab go that high without knowing that there's some kind of back there. And I don't know what it's like having that much money or how easy it is to get cash out. That's like getting credit but it's at the pretty br- There's like, not. It's you, hard to get cash out. It's hard to get cash that. out because if you go get 10 grand out... Just ask the, Kyle. If, if <laughs> you go, trying to get, I've been trying to get you 180. I haven't seen 180. Thank you, yeah. No, but if, you, if, you, go, if you go out and you get uh, 100K, or if you go out and get 10K... There's going to, you know, the FDIC is going to be looking at you. Mm-hmm. And so, like, you got to go do that 50 times, like, and then do that another, you know, nine times. Like, that's not happening. So, you, even if Otani's the guy, initially, when I didn't think it through, I was like, well, why would he, why would he be doing wire transfers? But there's no other way to do it when you owe that much money. It, Let me it, interject. It's all, it's all get... wire transfers, it, and, and that's the way they have to do it. But the problem is that he has to authorize this. There, there's no way he doesn't know about this, and and and, and they should have they should have framed it as a loan instead of talking about this theft thing and left it at that. Yes, that would have exactly been. And what also, they, what's shocking to me is that they, if if we're to believe that Otani was gambling and he was the fall guy, that they didn't have like a real plan, because this thing has been sloppy. Like the sending him to ESPN, retracting the statement, you know, then calling him a thief. Like the timeline of this goes back to October. If this guy got his door kicked down in October. His clientele knows about it, no doubt. And I would like to see how Otani was hitting in October, <laughs> because if I, if oh. my translator was about to go down and it was me placing all these bets, I'd be nervous as fuck, and I wonder how he was hitting. <laughs> Are you looking in October? Right I, you know, there's a lot to be said. So, so anyway, if, if, yeah. let's say hypothetically, I, I rob somewhere and I have hostages, and they can't kill me, and they're going to have to meet my demands in order to keep human life alive. So if I'm like, I need. Ten million dollars in cash, like in the movies. How are they going to get this? Because you know, if if a hundred people got together and got ten thousand dollars, they couldn't meet my demands. So, where where do they? Where do you get the cash? In like, well, I ha- think the police can just get cash. Do they, they just have to, they the get, police are like uh, they they grab it from all the people that they stole from when they arrested them <laughs> or, or searched their houses. They sell but, all the weed that but, they plant on. Yeah, them. exactly. They're like, hey, you want to you want you want a dime bag of some Reggie Fire Miller? Sale. I'll give you I'll give you I'll give you nine nine five and a dime bag. So it's easier to be like, give me an airplane than the, it is cash. The probably. offshore account. The offshore account. Yep. But I want the big bag. Yeah, I don't think you can get the big bag. It's anymore. not like the movies, huh? So, anyways, I think I think this is a this is an interesting story. I think what it's what's also interesting about it is if you frame it in the context of where we are today, like we're seeing a lot of this stuff. Whether it's Calvin Ridley a couple years ago, whether it's the Jameson Williams uh, suspension, whether it's like hearing about the fact that Pui got popped in one of these uh, in these offshore gambling That's a whole probes, the alleged uh, rigging uh, minor of league the SEC play. games. There, there's alleged rigging of uh, a Temple game a couple weeks ago, and then they're playing in the conference tournament like a week later. Um, there's also, when you read this article, they talk about another case where they're like, uh, you know, a college basketball coach, you know, an unnamed player here, an unnamed player there got caught up in this ring. And what I think, you know, what I think people are losing in this thing is we're thinking at this juncture that this is going to change sports. I think it could change sports. I, I think it already has. But I think what we're also, this is a perfect example of somebody who's from Japan, has never been able to gamble cannot handle the dopamine rush gets to america sounds like gets when i went on, to gets on draft the first time. yeah <laughs> gets on DraftKings. we got to send him home can't handle it <laughs> and he's just not ready and i think some people are not ready for the responsibility of gambling with their money uh, now i don't think that that we should i don't think that we should be out I, I love gambling i think it's i think it's awesome and i think if you're responsible it can be great and a lot of fun but people have to handle People have to handle their situations, and that's like, that's what it's going to come down to now. Is like, and that's the scary part because people are all fucked up, and people all want money, and people all want, you know, like people are willing to take risks. Like you just can't control people, so there's always going to be these situations. Athletes are just the same, where athletes bite off more than they can chew, or you know, you, you you're going to hear about a fix every now and again. It's just the new reality, and the only way to keep college athletes from doing this is that they they're, they're all paid and that and that's the that's the problem i think like you know we're talking about the mlb we're talking about some pro sports but i look at college as the biggest 
that's the biggest threat you to like give the integrity. Well, what did the Van, the Vandy quarterback just came out and that's said he was saying. approached? Not I don't so believe that unless I don't he believe, winds up. I don't either, but it was unless said. Unless he winds up in a ditch, I don't believe him. It was said. I'm just saying that it was put out there, so I, yeah. I'm not necessarily believing that either. But, the, you know, Puig also, there's there's other. I mean, this goes to the cartel, man. Yeah. Those guys are owning these guys and letting them go play and saying, hey, you got to pay us back. Yeah. So there, there's other things going on there. I Gambling is so prevalent now, which is fine. Let the guys do what they want to do. Just don't gamble on your sport. Just don't gamble you on could your do, sport. Like, the, like in Vegas with the Super Bowl, you can't be in a casino. You can't be here. Just let them do what they want, but just don't gamble on your own sport. And I, I think you're all which, right. Which, again, goes to show you, you can, you can, you can track DraftKings. You can track you know, all these MGM. You can track whatever. But you're not going to be able to track people who are betting with offshore books or, or with, with illegal bookies. And so, like, there's just – that that's one thing you're going to have to take a leap of faith on. The feds are going to get more involved in this sort of thing because it's a threat to legalized gambling and the faith in the institution that legalized gambling depends on, which is sports. So I, it's going to be interesting over the next five, seven years how this thing goes. I mean, like, you guys, did you guys read the Jags article? Yes. So this uh, article from Katie Strong in The Athletic is about um, Amit Patel. You've probably heard about this as the guy who stole, stole $22 million from the Jaguars. Mm. Um, he was working for the Jags. The, the article is called Feeding the Demon. And uh, my favorite part of the article, of course, this guy's getting ready to be sentenced for, for massive theft, um, is when they say Patel's attorney asked for probation citing his client's gambling addiction and subsequent recovery efforts as reasons for leniency. Like He's in the middle of a recovery here. We can't send this guy to jail. Four, four, four years, $22 million of fraudulent charges on the club credit card when covering his tracks by sending falsified files to the team's accounting department. How would that work, Macon? Yeah, that part wasn't made exactly clear. But hey, hey guys, we I'm needed a new scoreboard. It. Yeah. It yeah. costs $12 million. And it only costs six. Right. <laughs> it's like, dude, it's just so brazen. Like, this is what, what, what you know, addiction does to people, whether it's gambling or alcohol or whatever. Um, and it said when he was at his the lowest of the low, he would forget to brush his teeth. And then he would sell his personal items, donate his plasma, take out payday loans, or yep. I mean, I've been up work doing cell phone repairs. I've been down bad on some Romanian tennis from time to time. <laughs> he was on the I've Turkish never, volleyball. Never, I've never forgotten to brush my teeth. No, no, no. There's I'm, a, I'm still wiping my ass. I think this losing. this you know guy I mean? this guy's trying to make him seem him seem like, you know, somebody who didn't have agency. But he had enough agency to buy vehicles, condos, designer watches. He was flying private. He bought a watch for a hundred thousand dollars. And this is the exact kind of crypto bro whose eyes are too big for their stomach. Like, you know, it's like I I everybody's got to get rich and i think that's a plague in america is like everybody wants to get rich quick and this guy sees gambling as an opportunity and the victim here is the jacksonville jaguars he's facing 84 months i think he was sentenced to 72 yeah 72 okay yeah. He, he, he supposedly experienced the rush of gambling for the first time on a cruise trip to the bahamas the summer before he left college i don't think kids can handle the dopamine rush of gambling. You I don't think college picture. kids can handle it. Like, I understand that it, 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 when you're 18, you can go to war, you should be able to gamble, all this stuff. Like, you're an adult in the United States. But if you'd have given me a DraftKings app when I was in college, I would have lost my mind. Yeah. Now, there's a lot more to lose. Like, you know, I could go broke. Like, I'm smarter. I have less testosterone. I'm just less, like... Although my T levels were pretty high. I got my blood work done a couple weeks ago. Oh, congrats, Thanks, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. That's huge. He said, the devil inside me is like, let me just deposit 25K from the card. I'll turn it into 50. I'll put the 25K back. He was betting on the Jaguars against the Chiefs. He my bet favorite, that was my favorite one, an $18,000 six-way parlay. <laughs> Five <laughs> MMA bets that hit. That all hit. The Jags didn't hit. <laughs> the Jags didn't. And then, and, then, and, then, <laughs> and then to think, man, I was on the other side of this bet. He bet the Jags against the titans late last year yeah it's like his last gasp um but they <laughs> oh, lost no. uh by the way kyle a he might have been your cl classmate at yeah, fsu fsu 2010 so okay i missed him you missed him but again like this this gambling stuff is just gonna you're gonna hear more and more stories and i don't know how you get a handle on it i like it's just like the nil <laughs> the thing it's just like dumb. the transfer portal thing like in sports usually we know you know how the next five to seven years are going to lay out and like there aren't the we're getting hit in the sporting world with multiple big changes 
like the transfer portal, like NIL. This and guy now, worked like, at Deloitte. Like Imagine the guy who didn't get caught, Chris. No, Imagine yeah. the people that are in charge of – so, like, Deloitte's one of the big three, I feel like, in the yeah. finance world. If there are people at Deloitte, like Mr. Patel – that are doing this without being caught. Isn't imagine, Deloitte a consulting firm? It is. Yeah. yeah. Imagine okay. what's happening with your dough. Yeah. Easily my favorite favorite line it's, in the article. You never know. This guy. It could be on the Jaguar. Yep. This guy bristled at the suggestion that he was a neophyte and historically bad gambler. <laughs> as one that report, was the thing he he's like, take. I'm not bad at this. I'm just <laughs> losing a lot. <laughs> I, I, Which is a telltale <laughs> sign that you're addicted to gambling. Yeah, it's 22 million, but a, a big win is right but around I was the up corner. For a while. You guys yeah. caught me when I was down. It's not a bad right gambler. The corner, I, I, I think yes. we should speak to the young gamblers coming up. Yeah. Okay. I think there's a couple things you need to remember. One, there's a reason there's all those lights in Vegas. Yep. All right. Don't think you're going to win when you go there. And the flowers. They replace the flowers every night at the win. Uh, and the books give you like extra money when you spend money. And yeah. I'm trying to teach life lessons here. They were That's giving him saying. extra money. They Number were giving two, him, him yeah. extra money to bet. Number yeah. two, don't Draft bet camp. money you don't have. Yep. Number one rule. Yep. That's it. Number Everything else three, is cream cheese after that. If you are on the fence about something, give yourself advice you would give to your best friend. Okay. Don't gamble drunk. Don't gamble high. Um, if you're about to bet Stay away from the teasers unless about, you're me. No teasers. Bet the unders. Unders always. Would I advise my friend hurt. to make this bet? Do you think the book has any responsibility? Like this person is losing tens of millions of dollars. They're continuing to give him rewards and benefits to try to get him to keep playing. Like, is that predatory? I don't know. Is there is there a is there a corollary in America where? Yeah. You could... Philip Morris was like, nah, "Hold on, there, smokers." Yeah, yeah. Philip Morris I, never did that. That's now, an interesting. Well, I don't know where I, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. Because when I lose, I like it when they give me a free bet. Like I'm gonna take that. That's I fine. think maybe you should have to show proof of funds to gamble, you know. And then pr based on that, you know, there's a responsible gambling act where, mm -hmm. you know, possibly like, hey, if if you if you show your assets and you know, like the state of Louisiana passed a law that <laughs> allows them to garnish uh, FanDuel earnings or DraftKings earnings child for support. child support. I saw a guy I'm just fine got, with that. A guy just got mad yeah. that uh, he was amazing. he got caught using his child support money uh, on DraftKings. Yeah, and he won a parlay and it got docked. I think you're talking about two different things, though, Matt. Like mm -hmm. you're talking about, OK, you have to put the money up front to put a play in legally. Yes. Now, if you're talking about, you know, the corner book, it, that's a little different. You're providing a service. No one's putting a gun to your head to make this play. So, but it, it, another thing is, a lot of times now you're chasing this guy because it's all you know. It's based on credit. So, yeah, yeah. There, they, they, I, there's a moral standard of that. DraftKings can't break your knees. You know what I mean? There's that no shit deterrent don't happen there. Anymore. No, I know, but there's no deterrent there. And you know, you think about a prototypical bookie. At least the responsibility you have with a bookie is, unless you're Otani, you're probably delivering cash. So you physically have to have the money, and if you don't deliver it, you might end up, you know, sleeping with the fishes in, in traditional. It's more about killing your reputation, and you're yeah. not going to get action anywhere else. But at DraftKings, you know, they're not, you know, like it's it's funny money, it's electronic money, it's you know, you don't have to show your net worth, you don't have to show up with cash. Like there's no, there's no fear of of anything beyond like losing your money. Which if you don't deliver to the book, like there are probably still some bookies that. Yeah, honor among thieves. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the NFL and, and more rule breaking. Kirk Cousins, yeah, okay, in the tampering Kirk period. God. You talk about the reason that the NFL does so well, not only the, the product on the field, but like also they have the calendar strategically on lock. Like, and part of it is they open the floodgates at you know, the exact same time for everybody. And they know that, hey, it's been a little bit of time since the, the Super Bowl. We had, you know, the combine. Legal tampering period starts right now. And, and the they, deal's and, done. And they don't want... Yeah, and that's the curious part of it. Is a lot of deals are done right away. So you have to figure, like, some of these deals are getting done in earnest before the legal tampering period opens. And the NFL is probably okay with that, but this is an entertainment value decision for them. Setting a date on the calendar and saying, like, guys, if you got all your friends out to start a race and somebody kept jumping the gun, you'd be like, hey, motherfucker, all at the same time. Yep. And that, and I think that's what the NFL wants out of this thing. Like, they know the cap, 
even before the cap. They know where the direct, because I wondered, you know, is the legal tampering period about protecting players from negotiating before they know the cap and they know their value and that sort of thing? I don't think it's necessarily that. I think what it is, is if you're an agent and you go to the combine, or you don't go to the combine rather, and you, you don't have time to sit in a room and figure out the value, the market value of the player that you're representing, you're kind of flying blind. I think the combine is by nature, um, it's kind of like a, a, a black market, right? Where teams are in there and agents are in there and they're, they're, they are tampering, they are talking. If you bug the combine, it would make you blush. Like there's a lot going on that I don't think is being reported upon. And then when the floodgates open, all this happens. So what happened is Kirk Cousins up there at his first press conference down in Atlanta threw a pick six, his first shot. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like, hey, when I talked to the Falcons yesterday and it's day one of the legal tampering Whoopsie period, Daisy. everybody's like, eh. Now, if I were Kirk Cousins, and, and this is what I would do, because everybody knows it's a whirlwind, right? It's always a whirlwind. How many times have you heard the? I would go with the whirlwind defense. I'd be like, man, I don't I know what day, day it was. Yep. It was 12.15 this morning, and I thought it was yesterday. You know, and I think that probably worked unless they bugged his phones, and then he's, he's texting with Atlanta's trainers. Here's the one thing about Kirk that I think is unique and injured players. I almost think there should be a, a period that opens up earlier for injured players, like somebody coming off an Achilles. When you join a new team, that rehab process might be different than the team you just came from. And I, I know Minnesota has a great athletic training staff. I know some of the guys up there, they're probably doing a great job, but Atlanta's probably doing something a little different. So if you're going to be spending the next six months of the, the calendar get a head start. rehabbing, like you should be able to get a head start with your new team. I like that. So if you're hurt, I think the legal tampering period should open earlier. So I understand that in this situation, it Injured is- Injured reserve hurt. Yeah, it's not, it's, not as, it's not as clandestine as like, you know, Tom Brady on a yacht. Mm -hmm. That's what docked Miami a pick. Uh, you know, it's not as bad as the Macklin tampering, which <laughs> docked Kansas City multiple picks that were fines. Um, it's not as bad as John Gannon getting tampered with when he's under contract with the Eagles and getting ready for the Super Bowl. So I think we might see a slap on the wrist, but, you know, it does lend itself to an interesting conversation about the reason for the legal tampering period and then what the NFL is actually going to do about it. And they're kind of stepping into the NBA's field. Like, NBA has illegal tampering happen every single year. Like the Knicks just got fined for it for Jalen Brunson. My and they know, and they know, and there's no real like solution. Oxymoron legal tampering. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, legal they, they, tampering. They need to change the name of the period anyways. But an, an interesting part call of this. It the percolation period because things are happening. Mm. It's just things are happening. percolating. And, and PFT, uh, Pro Football Talk, the real Pro Football Talk, uh, Mike Florio said that, you know, he talked to an executive who said this is like awful and they should be doc picks. And like the Vikings could be, um, you know, the, the Vikings could be owed picks in this situation. Like if you go by the letter of the law, there is a scenario where, and it happened with the Cardinals and the Eagles, where they swapped picks and there were picks exchanged as a result of the tampering. Um, the reason that could be really big is the Vikings have quietly, this trade fell under the radar. The Vikings traded uh, with Houston and accrued some capital that they can 23rd pick this year. they can throw into a, a deal to move up for a quarterback like if they were swapped rushers if they were able to accrue another pick out of this thing it, it only helps them more and and so like the vikings that tells you that they're probably going to try to move up and grab somebody in the wake of that trade which is bad for my guy sam darnold but good for the vikings because the vikings i think are an extremely well coached team and you know they, they're talented and so, you know, they're in a division that... Howard calls him the tall McVeigh. He is the tall McVeigh. I think he's going to have that kind of... was a funny way to put it. No, that's a funny way to put it. Uh, you know, I, I think the Vikings could be, could be angling to make a big move. So let's talk quarterbacks. Let's start with the Caleb Williams Pro Day. Love it. What would you guys see? You know, it's a lot of the stuff coming out this past week has the important stuff to me is the stuff that is not on the football field. Um, I remember when his backup quarterback came in, played in the Holiday Bowl. He had, you know, six touchdowns, five touchdowns. That was incredible. Broke the single game record, and people said, is <laughs> it the Lincoln off. Riley offense or is it Caleb Williams? What's the deal there? I remember the team was saying, we're a team now. You know what I'm saying? And from the outside looking in, a lot of people, it left a bad taste in their mouths about this guy, Caleb Williams. You know, Well, there was the crying. Which why is he not playing? Like, why is he a crybaby? Why does he paint his nails? And why is this backup quarterback breaking your records? game one in the biggest game of the year. And what I read this week was that Caleb 
understood that when he was gone, it would leave a void in the free agency market, the NIL, what is the transfer portal market, and every quarterback in America wants to play in Lincoln Riley's offense. Mm -hmm. Say, with it all transfer. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm not playing, you're playing, dominate, and then it's your spot next year again. And Spin that's zone. What, and that's what happened. Yeah. Um, my, allegedly. My friend stole from me. So, in my opinion, <laughs> Caleb Williams did him a solid. It speaks volumes about his character. Um, I love to see Keenan Allen in team-issued gear at the Bears. Pro, Dapping him at up. At the USC Pro Day. Obviously, Keenan lives in the Southern California yeah. area, still has for a long time. <laughs> to go there and be standing there like a scout, essentially, and be like, what's up? And Caleb yeah. sees him. That dap, that's the first of many daps between those two players. Possibly. Um, potentially. Potentially. And it was exciting. And, and I saw him throw left-handed. I saw him throw absolute long shot bombs. It's exciting. Caleb Williams is the, is the guy, in my opinion. He and threw it, the ball 65 yards. I can't wait to watch him play yeah. on my Madden team. That's going to be great. Because, you know, the passing game is, is the meta in the game. And if you've got a quarterback like Caleb Williams, you can make every throw on the run. On time. Going left, going right. Because if you're right. controlling him, you can throw it on time. Yeah, and the, po the pocket poise is something that I'm excited about from him with this Bears offense. People think that Chicago is where quarterbacks go to die. I think this is the guy that disproves that theory. So what I thought was interesting about it, it it's a campaign to show that he can throw on time, right? Like the pro day. As if throwing on time at a pro day tells me anything. Now, I'm not saying he's not going to be great. I've been... Like two years ago, I thought he was the second coming of Jesus Christ. But in the last year, I kind of came back down to earth a little bit. I'm a little bit more like, hey, pump your brakes. One of the reasons is the 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 clock. You know, like in college, he was not asked to to play within a timing structured offense. And Wait that's, on rookie mode timing. Yeah, and so like people want to see, can he get the ball out of his hands quickly? He's got Brock Purdy's coach, which I think is an interesting decision. Now I'm not in that world of knowing who each quarterback guru is. But if there's one thing I think Brock does um, does well most of the time, and when he doesn't, he actually does a good job of extending plays. Is you know he understands the timing of an offense, and I think you know like if he's going with a Brock Purdy coach, that says a lot about what he's they're admitting is a deficiency or something that they want people to think that he's going to be better at. Um, they say lots of timing throws from the pocket uh, during that that pro day. Daniel Jeremiah called it a salad pro day, which is basically like it's just a, like a little appetizer. So there wasn't much that you could really glean from it. Um, do you remember Zach Wilson's pro day? Mm -hmm. So all I'm saying is these pro days, these workouts at the combine where they throw the ball on air. I remember watching Justin Herbert at the combine, sailing passes, missing guys left and right. And, you know, I, I just don't think there's a lot to glean from a pro day. You know, he looks pretty throwing a ball, no question. The deep ball, 65 yards, great. But I, we're not going to know until he gets into a uniform. Do you think players stand to gain from not participating in the pro day? It depending on who you are. Marvin Harrison Jr., is, gotcha. you know, he says, I'm not working out at the pro day. Um, when I did my pro day, I didn't let the teams work me out. I let Al Groh work me out because I knew there was more to lose if somebody, you know, some – I thought that pro day was a unique opportunity, though. It was like you get to be with that staff that could potentially draft you. I remember, I remember vividly. I was working with Ryan Clanton and a few of the guys at Oregon, and the Bears were there. And um, and like you said, it's either you work out with your guy or you work out with them. And I remember I started with with our guys, and then they kind of took over. I looked at it as an opportunity for as a player, like if Caleb, if you know if the Bears coaches wanted to go out and run some drills, I, I would advise a young player to say yes. But if they're going to take him anyways, it doesn't matter. Like for you, you were slotted as bottom of the first round guy. Yeah. Well, yeah, in my and, position. And, and maybe that helped you yes. jump some spots. You're right. And so like it just depends on who Yours you are. And, mine were different and how much leverage you have. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I, I get why somebody might not want to work out, but I, I, I would say, like, hey, the you pro day, show off. it's hard to know when it comes to looking at a quarterback throwing on the air. Even if it's not for the, the team that's going to draft you, you'd know that there's going to be cameras on you, and especially in, in today's age, you're going to be on ESPN. Like, show off a little bit. Yeah, no question. There's a story for Carson Palmer's uh, pro day where uh, I, I don't think a couple of scouts ever heard this, but he said, hey, you want nose up or nose down? And they're like, what are you talking about? 
and he said, I could throw the ball flat or I'll throw the, 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 the nose coming down. And they were like, whoa. Okay. And he did it, and it was pretty. And he could, and he could throw. Yeah. He, he, was a, he was a hell of a quarterback. He man. goes, you want a catchable or you want me throwing a missile? And it was like, wow. Yeah, this guy's giving it to us how, however you want it. And, like, in a situation like that, you can come away impressed. But, you know, you've got the Caleb Williams uh, pro day. You have the Justin Fields news, which we haven't really talked about. Um, yeah, and Kev made a great point. They they really, you know, the Friday news dump, they slipped that in on like St. Patrick's Day weekend in Chicago. <laughs> they were like, get everybody as drunk as possible. They could have done it at any point, you know, and uh, people yeah. went from happy beers to sad beers. Yeah. Quick. Or happy beers, depending yeah, on who you Yeah, it depends on who you are. You know, because I think that city's pretty divided, Kyle. But we can all agree on the fact that Justin Fields gets an opportunity to have a rebirth in Pittsburgh. And if you're a Fields fan and a Bears fan, you'll celebrate it when, if and when he does become That's the starter. That's if Caleb's good. Yeah, I mean, we're we're assuming that the pick that they go with at one will be the answer we at quarterback. Ass- we are assuming. But we're talking about Justin Fields. So much, yeah. So it's like, you know. If Caleb does well and Justin takes over and plays well, we're going to have celebrations in both cities. Pittsburgh's going to hit the lottery, and the Chicago fans will say we did right by our guy. Or you could have, or you could have it be a, a you know a, a, a zero. I don't know if it's a zero sum game for both of them. Or yeah, you Russell's know, the like, starter forever, and Caleb's okay. Or or they're bo- or they're both. It doesn't work out. Yeah, you know, and so I, I think there's a whole host of. Uh, I, I think everybody thinks they're going to be right or wrong in this. What thing. does working out look like for Caleb Williams in his first year? What's the Mendoza? Well, it's like? not even about his first year, but you better be in the playoffs and making deep runs on his rookie contract because yeah, what you say by making this trade is that this guy is going to put us on a trajectory, not unlike you know a C.J. Stroud deal, where C.J. Stroud a year into his contract, you're going to talk about Houston in a second. And everything they've done, he's an anomaly. That window, but that's what you're saying. Caleb should be well. The that's, lot, it's that's somewhere between excessive. where Fields had you, which was man, we're pretty close to making the playoffs, and the C.J. Stroud thing, which is we could give Patrick Mahomes a run for his money on the road or at the NRG Stadium. So I mean, that's a big gap to put. But but I will say, the way people who are pro making the trade and sending Fields away and drafting Williams. They are doing it because they think this guy is Patrick Mahomes. So don't move the goalposts if he's not. I think that's that all this I'm guy saying. gives you the best opportunity on third downs. He gives you the best So you're excited. I'm excited okay. because I think we have a quarterback now. Well, we have the opportunity to get a quarterback on the roster who can make those third and manageables into pretty routine downs. Mm-hmm. And you know as an O-lineman, it's going to be a quick snap throw your hands and the ball's out and it's to the right guy. And with Keenan Allen with a short area quickness, his route running ability, even later on in life in football life, he's able to get open. And if they run zone, he can find the soft spot. And they could draft another he has receiver. That, he's got that Kelsey to his classes. game, which I love. DJ Moore is there. Those two are enough. If you want to get another guy, go with Adunze at nine. And here's what I feel. I feel for Justin you've Fields. You've got though. so many weapons. I feel for Justin Fields though, because that was not the experiment that he was put into. So the, the, the outcome of his experiment is going to be judged through a different lens. Um, and, you know, the, Look, the John Fox got were fired. He built the best defense in football. Vic Fangio inherited it, and people celebrated Vic Fangio, and he went on trajectory as a coach. But John Fox built that defense. Yeah. Nobody but, gives him that credit. But it's, so not, it's not even about Fields building anything. It's about when Fields comes in, what's the house look like? The house was shot when Fields came in. The the mock up of what I saw that's, the that's other day. The NFL. No, it's the NFL. It's not fair. And I'm just saying when people wanna like Monday morning quarterback this thing, just realize that if if Justin Fields uh, had a Roma Dunze or um, you know, Keenan Allen and DJ Moore from his rookie year a stable of three backs. We have a different conversation. A top ten defense. We're probably having O-line. a different conversation. O line is and is and a mess. you know I think that's one of the questions I have in uh, in Pittsburgh because like everybody on the service is really excited about Justin Fields being up there, but their wide receiver room is not great right now. They got rid of Deontay Johnson. You got Pickens and then so you know Pickens like can block his ass off and Justin can run his ass off. So you add another blocker into the equation. But is that you're... offense any more talented than the offense he just came from? Uh well, is he going to be playing? And that's the question. And if you're Pittsburgh, do you want to play him early? You don't because there is a universe where you could you could not get docked a, com- a compensatory pick and still use him down the back, the back half of the season. Like if you give this guy a reset and you, you go eight and a half games or whatever it is to hit that 49% mark and nothing above it, like there's a, a universe where you stick the landing on the pick. Although I don't think the pick is is – 
is impactful enough that if week six Russell's not playing well, you're going to wait to put Justin in. I think you put Justin in as soon as Russell's not playing well. And Russ has not dealt with a situation like this. I think there's, I think what's interesting about Russ, and I learned this late in my career as a veteran, like when I was young, I was a high draft pick, then I was like, you know, a top five free agent in my position. So at that point, I'm feeling like, you know, this is what the NFL is like. Like I have clout, I have, I, you know, people don't fuck me over. Oh, like, gee. Now Russ is getting to see what the, the other half lives like. And I got to see that late in my career as a position player yeah. where all of a sudden you're like, man, that's not fair. You know, you're used to fair. Russell got dicked down in Denver and then, yeah, and then, and then ended up, you know, thinking, oh, I've escaped and somebody wants me. He cuts his hair. He's, he's puts on a black sport coat. He's, you know, he, we're seeing the Zoolander memes of him in the coal mine. And you're thinking this is going to start the <laughs> Russell Wilson in Pittsburgh chapter. And then he finds out like a couple days later that they've had, they've had something in their back pocket. And maybe it's Arthur Smith getting to Pittsburgh and convincing them that this guy is going to be able to run his offense because last year all we talked about was Arthur Smith and the Falcons making a move for Justin Fields. And maybe they would have made that move had Arthur still been there. Um, so I, Russell Wilson seeing how the other half lives, he's not only feeling the unfairness of the NFL, but he's also feeling the pressure because he's never had a guy backing him up like this. The minute he doesn't play well, that, that stadium, that city is going to turn on him. He posted the same uh, workout video that he did two years ago when he got signed to Denver. Him he probably change it up. In, it different uh, video, same, right. same setup. Yeah, 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 yeah. But he was down in Florida ripping the ball. Uh, Pretty like, stoked. Quinn Miners fans. made fun of him on Twitter. Yeah, he's like, you posted the same thing when you came to Denver. Well, yeah. hey, let me ask you this. When it just comes to the trade fields th- to the Steelers and what the Bears got in return, why not keep them? That's – and so like that, what is I, I, that to me is is a move when it, that's a that's a psychological decision mm-hmm. where you're like all right getting a, a six for Justin Fields is not a great haul but we don't is this is get is is worth peace of mind is is getting another mid round pick at the middle of the season next year worth stunting possibly Caleb's development because he's worried about a guy behind him people can say that's not fair. You know, to but you're investing a ton in this guy. I kind of I kind of understand the the thought process of hey, I don't want him to feel pressed. And well, you've got to feel and pressed. And want a veteran mentor as well. Like we talked about it last year with Zach Wilson not being an ideal backup. I've but, also heard and read that the Bears brass wants a reputation for doing right by guys, and that's giving Justin a fresh start. Even with if a it's behind another guy. I yeah. don't know if I believe that report 100%. I think that that report also exists in context. I think I th- I don't think there were a lot of teams interested in the market and what they but his agent comes out and say there were other teams that were interested yada yada yada. There might have been a smaller pool of teams that were interested just because most of these teams that would be interested are looking to the draft. And they're saying like, listen, I'm going to move up in the top five, or I'm sitting firmly in the top five, and I'll I'll roll the dice on a devil I don't know. Yep. And do you remember where this started? Was Mel Kiper saying the Bears may ab- may be able to get a first rounder for Justin Fields, maybe number eight from Atlanta. Yep. And so when you start with with that framework, and then you you end up getting a six, it's sort of like the hundred dollar bet that you cash out for a dollar 82 yes. when the team's down seven in the final yes. minute it's just like fuck yep let and me get something you don't want to get past a certain point in the off season and you say hey we just want to rid ourselves of this conversation and also free caleb up to be in here unencumbered not feeling the pressure of another guy on top of the city pressure and the franchise pressure and the number one pick pressure and most super bowls in the last decade have featured a quarterback on a rookie deal so we're talking about the quarterbacks here. I mean, obviously, that was a big story last week. We've kind of moved past it. There's been a lot of free agency movement even in the second week. You know, like the first week is a big rush. Uh, you, we go back to talking about, like, like the NFL and the, the stories of free agency and the way that they, you know, it's, like, very beneficial to them to have them all come out at once. I think the Dallas thing, for instance, me and Nolan were talking about this, Dak – you don't think they've got – Dallas isn't doing dick. They know they have to extend <laughs> Dak, right? Or, or, you know, like the ship sailed on bringing in Russell Wilson for a million dollars and pissing him off and waving the no trade clause. That was my theory. That could have worked. Mm-hmm. But you don't think they already have a handshake deal done? You don't think they already have their deal done? That There is a possibility that Jerry's like, yeah, Roger, I'll drop this news when you really need it. You know, like I think that's the way it works sometimes. And so – 
you know, I, I, I think as we frame all this free agency action, the Calvin Ridley deal, like, you know, uh, maybe that was done before free agency started. One deal that probably wasn't done before free agency started was the Mike Williams deal. That popped up this week. The house of cards up there. It, here's, here's the... Tyron, listen, got Tyron. Here's the, you got Tyron, you got Morgan Moses. Here's what I'll say. For a team that, and I looked this up, last year, offense had the second most adjusted games lost to injury. Okay? 27th as a team. They bring in Tyron Smith, who's often injured, but plays at a high level when he's not. Yep. You bring in Morgan Moses off a of peck, and you bring in Mike Williams, who's, who, like, the first thing you think of with Mike Williams, when you, besides 50 50 ball and great talent, is injury. And so you're bringing Mike Williams to the MetLife turf. You're 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 filling in. To, and I think they're better if all these guys are healthy. The offense they're a much got better. better team if they're healthy. But what you have to realize is like Joe Douglas and Robert Sala are in burn the ships mode. But what I think is cool about what they're doing is they're burning some of the ships. Burning the ships would entail trading away draft capital for a one year run. Like it would it would mean like setting the franchise back. The reason these are okay, I think, is because if these guys get hurt, you're not going to be hurting as a result of these moves in four years. Long term, yeah. Joe Douglas and Robert won't be there. And, you know, they have to take these gambles. If you have a healthy Mike Williams next to Garrett Wilson, Garrett Wilson got doubled as much as anybody in the league. I, without having to look, I would imagine, just judging by the people around him and the threats outside of him in the passing game, this is going to help him a lot. I also think the one thing that's interesting is I'd like to go back and look at Chargers tape I bet you Mike Williams is a pretty good is a pretty good back shoulder fade catcher. He's a good 50-50 ball guy. But when you think about Aaron Rodgers, like who's that big guy that he can throw that back shoulder fade to? And I, I think Mike Williams <laughs> would work really well in this offense if he is healthy. But I have concerns about the injuries. It is curious for a team with with injuries like that last year that they go out and, and risk it on guys with injury history. Yeah. Kinlaw. Yeah. Kinlaw too? New York Jets. Yeah. 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 So, nice little off season for them. It's a good off season if everything breaks right. Tyrod Taylor. We talked about yeah. how important backups are. And and why and why show. not take risks? Because if you look around the the AFCs, you're not going to be there in a year if things don't go any well, anyways. But like Buffalo has has hit the restart button. They lost six starters the first couple of days. You know Miami is still feeling the effects of that spending spree from a couple of years ago. And you know they they've got to consider Tua now. Can I tell you something I like? And you can tell me if I know ball or not. Yeah. Daniil Hunter, Danico Autry to Houston. Oh. DJ Reader to Detroit. Yes. Mm -hmm. Love that. Cam curled LA Rams. He's Love good that. In Washington. There, there were more expensive options, and he's been a very good player. And, and also bringing back um, the guy from Jacksonville, Williams. Yeah. Uche stays yeah. in New England. Cheap, yeah. $3 million. Uh, The best thing that happened in New England last year was Judon getting hurt and Uche having to do it all himself and not being able to drive up his value. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, Tyler Biadish, Washington mm -hmm. Commander. Now, uh, Commanders did some good things. Mm -hmm. I'll say this: I was I was looking at the the kid from Luvu, Frankie Luvu, and I was yeah. thinking, oh, that'd be a good signing for Philly. They end up signing Devin White. I think the Devin White signing is interesting because if he can still run like he like he like he has for most of his his career, like you think about the best teams in the NFL, they're sideline to sideline. You want to be at San Francisco, you got to string out stretch plays. You got to be able to run with guys in the middle of the field. Like that speed is an intentional decision by Philly. Cleveland. Like, it's like watching Fred Warner play against you and Madden. Yeah, exactly. But That's you've like, never beaten me with the, the, with the Niners. Everywhere. Cleveland keeps Big Z yeah. and brings in Jameis. That's a fun little offseason. The interesting thing about Cleveland bringing in Jameis, and this is another psychology move, the fact that they let Joe Flacco walk, it's an admission that, that Deshaun Watson can't handle Joe Flacco in the building, nor do they think that the team can handle Joe Flacco in the building. That's crazy, and he's taking peanuts. He's in Indy, right? Yeah, he's taking yeah. peanuts. So, I mean, like, good for Indy, good for Anthony Richardson. You saw the way... I think Anthony Richardson will love having a guy like Flacco Man, you around. saw the way Flacco awesome. was working with Deshaun Watson. Like, he was like his big brother. He's going to be great for those guys, but the fact that the Browns let him walk. You mentioned the Texans. That's the, Chris and I that, talked about it. That's the winner. Like they, they, they have crushed it. They've upgraded everywhere. They lose Singletary. They bring in a 27-year-old Mixon. They lose uh, Grenard, who I think was great this year. They bring in a bona fide blue-chip guy in, in Hunter. They, they, they lose Rankins. They bring in Autry, who's one of my favorite interior and, and edge guys in the league because he can play both. So they kind of got faster in some spots. And Al Shair, who they got from the Titans – I think he's going to pay dividends for them because uh, Ryan's had him in San Francisco. And when you think about a guy that can 
that can run his defense, a fast backer. You know, like, I don't know, he's not Fred Warner, but to have a guy with that kind of speed in the middle of the field that can play the different kind of coverages that 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 you're, you're going to play and, and all that's demanded of a linebacker in his scheme, that's big. They got faster in a lot of spots. Tommy Townsend, Houston Texans. Tommy yeah. Townsend, we love Tommy Townsend. They're not sense, gonna of, sense of urgency in Texas with uh... – I mean, that, when you got a quarterback like that, you got to go. You go, you, you go. go. And this is the quickest, this is perfect for them. This is the way we talk about what I expect from the Caleb Williams deal or the Caleb Williams pick. If it works out to me, it's, hey, in the second year, we're able to say, hey, we were pretty good last year, and now we're going all in. And that's what they're doing. And I think, and Kyle and I said this, Kyle was like, everybody's going to want to play with Houston and Madden next year. They, you know, Well, shit, they want to play with them now, but they're making sanctions against us. You know, yeah, exactly. We're so good with them. But I think the real the, the thing is this. If you're building your team in the offseason, you're building it to beat the Kansas City Chiefs. Yep. Whether you're in the AFC or the NFC, you got to see these motherfuckers at the mountaintop eventually until yep. Mahomes retires. So how are you going to best equip your tool belt to frustrate Patrick Mahomes? You go get the best rusher you can. That's Daniel Hunter. You compliment it with the Autry signing, and you let that offense, who can already go tit for tat with anybody in the National Football League, continue to mature and develop. And they haven't really touched the offense outside of you know the Mixon signing. Don't touch um, it. You know what they what they have done is good for Tank Dell and for Nico Collins. They haven't brought in an expensive wide receiver that they're yep. going to have to pay in a couple of years. But Don't what the, what they it. will do is they will draft a wide receiver because this is a deep class, and if they have one more weapon, who. What they got if, Dalton Schultz, they got fuck. It's gonna be. What if I told you they added a number three overall pick at the cornerback position? Ooh. Now, third team in three years, but Jeff Okuda, Okuda. one year deal. Okuda. Why not? Yeah, you know why not? I mean, like, l- listen. I think all these sign. I trust Nick Casario. I trust that they know exactly where they are. They've hit everything in stride so far. They're just going to keep. They're going to keep moving forward. And I think they're America's team. When you look at the AFC next year, they are as as favorite in my mind as anybody to challenge Kansas City. And an upgrade, slight slight upgrade in unis. Yes. What'd you think? Slight upgrade. Okay. For example, the Ravens. They got Derrick Henry, yep. and everybody wants to tweet how excited they are, and we all see the Derrick Henry highlights, but how does that help you beat the but Chiefs? But that quarterback in Houston? How does that help you beat the Chiefs, that bro? That quarterback in Houston, buddy, he's already there. And I love Lamar, and Lamar's an MVP, but like, I would take C.J. Stroud over Lamar. 100%. And so, and so, that, and so that, is why, that is why when you look at like Baltimore and adding a piece, like do they change? Yeah, they had more leads than anybody in the league last year. They needed a big power back. Uh, they, you also want Derrick Henry healthy late in the year. So to me, they're still going to add another back. Keaton Mitchell's going to be hurt for much of the year. Like to me, the Houston moves are like not checkmate moves, but they're moves that you know you're angry Serious to, moves. to get the the king or the queen or however the fuck you play Serious chess. moves. Like, you know they're a move away. You know where the where the Ravens check not checkmate. The Ravens added somebody. They also lost a lot of players. Yeah, and they they looked like the same old playoff and team the when Chiefs, it came to not the Chiefs. Time. If it's if if it's not the Texans, in my opinion, it's the Chiefs that are flat out winners in free agency. The Hollywood you, Brown thing's great. You retain the biggest. Yeah, he drops the ball. Some the yeah. biggest more winning the same, rusher but. in like playoff history, like yep, Chris Jones. Chris Jones. Uh, the most clutch dominant rusher. The Sneed trade talks are kind of like uh, the street, fizzling out the a little Sneed bit. The Sneed trade talks are fizzling out a bit, and there's still time, but they've freed up contract space with Patrick, Yeah, and they've allowed Brett Veach to do what he does, and, well, th- and that's continue to add to a really good team. He doesn't want to fuck with the engine. He wants to just, you know... That- Fix that, a side mirror. That's the unique thing of having Patrick Mahomes on a deal like that. They've been able to convert, um, you know, uh, what, uh, base salary to bonuses the last couple of years. And doing that last year allowed them to pick up Mike Edwards, who played a lot of downs for them, and Drew Tranquil, who played a lot of downs for them. So oftentimes, when you're really good, people want to see you add big splash players, a la Hollywood Brown, even though it's not a huge splash. But what you're doing is you're making those incremental gains and fortifying your, your team. You I know, think with it's role a huge players splash, and that Hollywood sort of thing. Brown. So yeah, I think it, I think his sense of urgency goes through the roof because he understands that his targets are going to go up with Patrick Mahomes, his opportunity yep. to really win this thing. I mean, look, Lamar, and I heard it when I went to to Kansas City for the first time. That I was asking, "What's Patrick like?" Yada yada. They're like, "Let me put it to you this way: like we won the Super Bowl the year that Lamar won the MVP previously, and he did it again this year." And I remember that's all that Patrick was thinking about was like he's the MVP, you mm-hmm. know, like. 
we got to win the Super Bowl. When a guy like Hollywood Brown goes <laughs> goes to Kansas City, he will feel the entirety of the locker room not just say we have Patrick Mahomes, but like we are the Chiefs mm-hmm. and our quarterback is Patrick Mahomes. We are going to win this. Like, what's well, empowering? You're going to get the guy's best shot, dude. He's, I'm he's, telling you, Hollywood Brown's going to have his best year ever next year. Yeah, well, hopefully, I hope so. For, for... I, I might put a future in on that. Okay, y'all are disrespecting future. Clayton Toon. By the way, the Al Shaer move, like Sport Track, when you when you look up Sport Track and they try to, you know, guess at these free agent contracts, like Sport Track doesn't have a market projection. Research, researching linebacker price tags, we anticipate three years, twenty one million, seven million annual price tag would be two million above what the Titans paid. He got paid, bro. So this, I think, this speaks volumes about how important you think Al Shaer can be in Houston, and nobody would know it better than D'Amico. He had him in San Francisco. So the other moves that I think we should talk about. How about the law firm in Cincinnati, Brown and Brown, the two tackles now. You've got Orlando Brown and you've got Tra- Trent true. Brown. And I think the Trent Brown move is great. They've quietly done some really good things. I think adding Geno Stone was a great addition. The Rankins thing, you know I like Rankins. Um, they're going to miss Reader, but they're not going to have Reader for much of the year next year because of his injuries, even if he were back. So I think conversely that's going to be exciting for Detroit when he comes back. Detroit, by the way, added um, – a piece in Carlton Davis that I think is flying under the radar. The thing that's keeping them from being great is sometimes the quarterback and the back end. And Carlton Davis is a guy not only who can play, but he's also won a Super Bowl. And that kind of veteran experience, like DJ Reader coming in, he's been in a Super Bowl, like he's made deep runs, like that's what that team needs too. There's no group that would uh, benefit more from veteran leadership than the DB room in the NFL. No question. You need like a babysitter in there. Yes. And, and so, uh, you know, like Malcolm Jenkins is a perfect example when, you know, in Philly, like I just thought he was such a key piece because he was like such an adult in the room. And to have a guy back there, it's such an important room. Um, you know, that, that has experience and has played on great defenses. Um, the thing I was going to say about Trent Brown is this. Why did Joe Burrow get hurt last year? Running for his life? He got hurt because of the, the front side or the, the, the blind side bull rush. And he's a right handed quarterback, left tackle, Orlando Brown, who's a good player, and you play with him and everything. He got beat on a bull rush. He, his anchors, a little bit for his size, like can be a little bit questionable. Uh, Joe Burrow. He can escape just about anything but that rush, right? He can feel a nine-yard edge rush, and he's going to step up in the pocket. He can see stuff front side. He can handle middle pressure. But what he can't handle is a 370-pound man falling into his lap and hitting his hand or whatever it was. Like, remember I found that clip last year? That's how it happened. Trent Brown's best year, he was a left tackle. So I would consider, if I were the Bengals, swapping spots and putting Orlando at right. I don't know if he can play right, but Trent's best year, he was a lockdown left tackle. Look, and, that would be a, and he's that would, not that's getting my fly bored. on the wall candidate yeah. is when uh, Frank Pollock, who I believe is the offensive line coach in Cincinnati, sits both those two big motherfuckers down and says, okay, who's playing right tackle? Who's playing left tackle? Yep. Because I know it's going to be a conversation. It's probably going to be a conversation. Both guys are hard to move off their spot. Here, here's a signing that I was a Nobody little bit confused. Nobody wants to play right tackle. Kevin Byard to the Bears for two years, 15 mil. He didn't look that good in I'm Philly. I'm confused by that. A lot okay. Of so we're on the same page there. Um, I'm a little bit – I have trepidation about Green Bay's offense with Josh Jacobs and, and, and A.J. Dillon because Aaron Jones gave him so much – in, you know, out of the backfield in the passing game. Yeah. And so I just wonder how that, that shakes out. Back to hating the Packers. I, I, I loved appreciating the Packers for the last few years, not being an active roster bear, but there have been some aggregate accounts that have really said some nasty things to me in response to some of my Caleb Williams media yeah. uh, stuff. So I'm back on the FTP. Hating the Packers. Fuck FTP. the Packers. That's well, good. Robert Hunt was a guard that you called out last week as like, man, that guy got paid. And I said he won free agency. Yeah, he won free agency. He is going to make a career out of protecting little people. I mean, he did it with Tua. And now he's going to protect another little guy who gets the ball out quick uh, or should get the ball out quick if he knows what's good for him. I think that's that's the interesting thing. Like when you're a guard that gets paid that much money and you were on an offense that they didn't ask the guy to drop back for four seconds, like the ball was out quick, right? Like they they – that's a little bit curious to me, but he can only do what he can do. And, you know, if that's the offense he's in, I'm not going to dock him for that. But he's going to go up to Carolina and deal with another guy. He gets that, paid. All the other guard, guards get paid after No him. question. So, I mean, you reset the market, you're doing everybody a solid. The Calvin Ridley signing, I think, is taking too much heat. 
I really do. I like Calvin Ridley. And if you if you remember Body's Calvin Ridley. 25. Well, exactly. When you were coming out, he's 29. And when he was coming off of that gambling suspension, fresh legs, everybody was like, man, this is a big deal. Like Jacksonville is cleaning up with this guy. A year later, he gets misused in Jacksonville, in my opinion, because he's a slot guy. And it, all they have was slot guys down there. You know, and people are saying, and Trevor didn't play well this year. Doug didn't have his best year. People are saying that this is like a perfect example of a, a just a good player getting paid like a great player. Well, if you are Amy Adams, Strunk, the owner of the Titans, and you put out a statement when the changing of the guard happens and you reference directly great young players and a, a, an exciting young quarterback, you believe in Will Levis. So I see these moves as we are trying to win. And sometimes you got to overpay for people a little bit, especially if you're trying to, you know, fortify that that quarterback position you know like him having d hop and now calvin ridley in the slot and burks and we'll see how that works out but there's a lot of wide receivers in this draft that's exciting and so i i think people have a have a short memory with calvin ridley i think calvin ridley can help these guys and i think they believe in will levis I, it reminds me of when jacksonville quote unquote overpaid for christian kirk ironically what, what do you think about Tony Pollard, maybe the best number two back in the league, followed by a disappointing year as the lead back. Yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not as high on Tony Pollard, but in their minds, there's a reason that they signed him. And so, you know, the, this activity is not just activity for no reason. Like, they think that they are loading the cupboard up for a run. Take it on the field of a, of a fantasy football team a little bit, which probably does not work out more than not, but you got to surround Levis by with, with people. Yes. And, and to your point, yeah, could have done a lot worse than those two guys. So, listen, I, you know, um, there, there's a lot going on. Chase Young signed with the Saints. How old do you think he is? Chase Young? Yeah. 25. Hey, he's 24. Yeah, he's still young. Very. As the name ah. suggests. But, 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 you know, like injuries, right? He's kind of getting into this clowny schedule where it's just going to be year to year mm -hmm. deals and, and trades for people that need, you know, a defensive end. Potential. Paying for potential, but also they've, they've seen the potential at work his rookie year. And I always said this, like his rookie year, I thought, like, pump your brakes a little bit. I thought he was overrated, and then he was underrated. I still think he's a good player if he's healthy. He did not make a big splash in San Francisco. San Francisco saved $3, three $4 million bringing in Floyd and letting him walk because he ends up making 13 down in, in, in New Orleans. But I think Floyd's he, a high-energy player. And he's also a guy who can win on the edge with his length and that want. sort of he's thing. He's the spinner in the A gap. He can also <clears throat> pick the B gap. But like you said, Smart. he's a formidable guy on the edge. He's played in multiple defenses with real heady coordinators. He can do any number of things. He's smart. And and so Chase Young heads down to New Orleans. He signs this deal. He passed the physical. And then two days later, he's getting his neck operated on. So I don't know what New Orleans is doing there. Uh, and I don't know how that stuff works exactly. But the last thing I'll bring up is Jerry Judy to Cleveland. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up, obviously you remember when Jerry Judy, he had the Star of David necklace and famously said, you know, I, I, my name's Jew, Judy. And people call me Judy, so, you know, I figured I'm like a Jew. My last name, Judy, people sometimes call me short for Jew, like one Jew, so I just got a Jewish star. So, yeah, I'm not Jewish, though. He goes to Cleveland where the Jewish population is 100,000, mm -hmm. okay? Now, that doesn't seem like a lot, Especially when you look at like New York City, whose Jewish population is like 1.1 million. But there are 10 million people in the New York metropolitan area. There are only 300,000 people in Cleveland. Huh. Okay, I can't find a city that has more Jews per capita than Cleveland. And I'm kind of wondering if my conspiracy theory is that he, he has read the Torah. They, and he's like they actually went down in numbers when Mitch Schwartz got out of there. <laughs> okay, yeah. But you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Maybe there's something to this Jerry Judy thing. He's Jewish for sure. I don't know. I didn't think Cleveland was a uh, Aiden. Are Cleveland, you not, not, not. What Jewish do you think is the most Jewish. Jewish city per capita in the United States? Skokie, Illinois. Probably New York City. No, it's not. Oh. I'm telling you right now, Cleveland's boy, not to Jew, Jew explain to you. It's like Lakewood, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Check it out. Lake. Lakewood, New Jersey. <laughs> it's not a city, dude. I'm just looking at Jerry Judy going to Cleveland. I'm like, what's up with this? Cleveland's big time, especially the east suburbs, Yeah, as is lower Marion, Pennsylvania. Really? Yeah. Per See, capita. I'm telling you, there's something to this. Well, check, out, check out Lakewood, New Jersey. There's something to Jimmy G <laughs> signing with the Rams, too. Okay, Jimmy G. I played golf with three Orthodox Jews in Lakewood, New Jersey. Really? One day at the public. I showed up, and they are like, this is the group you're playing with. And I was like... Oh boy. How were they? Like they were cool? They were the coolest motherfuckers yeah. ever. Yeah.
All right, so good short game. <sighs> good short. The Jews. Game. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why aren't there more Jewish guys on the tour? They're on the Torah. That's what is that? That's good, good, Kyle. All right. Unlike, no, keep going. Unlike the wrong place. Jimmy G going to what are you gonna say? Unlike Jews, Jerry Judy is disappointing though. Okay. <laughs> okay. To me. Okay. I mean the Alabama okay. pedigree. Skokie, Illinois, <clears throat> where I live in my yeah. first apartment, which is next door to the Holocaust Museum. Mm -hmm. And I would walk I would walk through the parking lot to my apartment and there would be people showing up at the Holocaust Museum. And like, they'd be like, Oh, this guy's Fuck you, this man. guy's here for the, <laughs> this guy's here for the skinhead reenactment. I'm like, hey buddy, it just grows like this. <laughs> Not <your fault>. Like <laughs> Jesus, this is very believable. <laughs> um no, but the Jimmy G thing going to LA. You think about this guy, where he's been, San Francisco, L.A., Vegas. That's where they shoot all the prawn, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and he has a history of being out to, to get a bite to eat with a, with a prawn star. I don't know about a star. A couple, page 28. She wasn't yeah, even a top 100 free agent. Page 28. Whoever he was out with that night. But, but I do think there's something to Jimmy G. Like, what's the over-under on porn stars he's going to smash in, in L.A.? Like 15? I think over? he goes movie star, traditional. Okay. Movie star. Maybe somebody from Euphoria. He should be in movies, dude. He yeah. Should, he should be in the next Top Gun. He's so damn good looking. He's a Euphoria type. <laughs> He's way better looking than Miles Teller. Really? You can Miles Teller fly? Uh, can what's his name fly a plane? Can Miles Teller fly a plane? Yeah. Uh, and he plays drums. Like seven hundred times better looking than Miles Teller. Seven hundred, bro. You see Miles Teller's and I, that's my boy. I've Did you interviewed see Miles Gun Teller. Too? I've Miles seen Teller? I've seen both these Miles, guys up I'm close, trying, bro. It's I've like, seen both these guys up close. Chris wants to bang Jimmy G. Bro. I don't want to bang Jimmy G. Leave that up to the porn stars, okay? <laughs> um, another free agency move that that I thought was interesting, a little bit off the radar, is, is uh, Greg Olson taking a seven million dollar pay cut because that's what's happening by Tom Brady joining the Fox team. So really? you, when you go from the number one to number two, in Greg Olson's case, you 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 take a seven hundred or seven million dollar pay cut. That's for real. Are you under the impression that I was <laughs> yeah, canceled? Well, uh, and then to add insult to Larry injury, King, on Jared top of that, Seinfeld. like Brady's going to make thirty seven million a year. Yeah, or some. What was Olson making? <clears throat> he was making ten. Chris, so we, don't, we don't call games. Huh? We don't do alternate broadcast calls. Well, let's do it. I mean, there's no salary cap, though. Why there's no salary cap. If they gave us 3.7 to keep them. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. But I think Greg's great at his job. He's awesome. Guys, the, the, these mailbags just came in. I just want to get your rapid-fire reaction to these questions. Favorite NCAA tournament memory ever? Well, I mean... it's Non-Virginia category? No, I'll give you Virginia, and it's not going to be the Natty. Natty was amazing. Natty was incredible. Natty gave me a chance to be on Sports Illustrated. Okay, I was the on the first cover time of that I realized Julius Peppers played in, the, in. He was my teammate, and then I realized that he also played basketball. And I went on so YouTube. Kind of a delayed. And I was like, "Holy <laughs> fuck!" Julius Peppers played That's in the final four. Game. It's pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great moment. I was like, "How am I gonna block Did they, him? Did one shining moment me. come on? <laughs> <laughs> they played the one shining moment in, in practice. But it was it was it was it wasn't the national championship, which was awesome. Sat next to Heath Miller, John Phillips, Tom Sandy, all the tight ends, and uh, we watched Virginia beat Texas Tech. It was incredible. I I, I beat Des Bryant. I, I we, we bet I don't know Des didn't even go to Texas Tech, but he wanted action on the game, so I found him and we bet a lot of money. Won that bet. I pulled some strings. Got you on the court after the game. Got on the, the court after the game. We got to pick up some confetti. We were wandering, but it was the Purdue game. Yep. The Purdue yes. game for me, Purdue game was what, like when we beat Auburn, I kind of felt like we, we, we got a little lucky, you know, with that foul call. And I knew that we were going to deal with a lot of people saying like, you guys don't deserve it, yada, 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 even though we won the natty. Um, but the Purdue game, Elite Eight, was one of the best basketball games I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And it was so up and down, and there was so much scoring. There were so many big shots hit. Like, if you get a chance to go back and watch that game, you might like Virginia basketball again. Like, when we were that team, who couldn't like us? Yeah. We didn't just play great defense. We knocked down shots off of pick and rolls. We, we hit big threes. We, we played physical. We didn't play tight. And I was tight. I was in the sports book in Vegas, hammered, and could not take it anymore five minutes ago in the game. I had to go back to my room. And I watched the final seconds of that game drinking airplane bottles in my wind suite. And I, I'll never forget <laughs> Amir that. Patel. I'm screaming. I'm like screaming at the top of my lungs, running around now. I'm all alone. 
But like that for me was my favorite NCAA memory, along with the upsets. Like I can think of like you know the the George Mason type you know upsets. And I'm always a big fan of the upsets. But when my team, your team, making went on that run, like you could pick almost any of those games. Yeah, Kyle Guy hit those three free throws against Auburn to get to the national championship game. But one of the best. Think about this situation. One of the best games I ever see I ever saw in person was Purdue Tennessee. Purdue ends up. Well, let me not let me not blow it here. Same situation. Carson Edwards, they're down two to Tennessee, gets fouled shooting a three. He goes up to the line and misses the first. One second remaining. He's got three free throws, misses the first. He's not going to – he can't win it now. Can you imagine that pressure? He knocks down the next two. Purdue goes on, scores 17 in overtime to beat Tennessee. Purdue advances to the, to the Elite Eight against Virginia. Virginia then has the miracle shot from Mamadi Diakite to send it to The pass was oh. incredible. Cisco. Cisco, yeah, he had the, the dyed hair. <laughs>